there. Uh, let's see here. But before I do that, I'll go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. We will get underway. So let us pray. Almighty God, thou gracious Father, you have made the heavens and the earth through your Son, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, who have hovered over the deep. Uh, we pray that you would dwell with us this day as we meditate on your majesty, on your creative power, on your governance over our life, and your will uh, to redeem and to save this fallen creation, having sent your Son into the world uh, to dispel the darkness and bring light to us. Uh, all this we ask through his holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. So just a couple of other things that I wanted to mention about how these days are structured here. As I said before, in verse 2, we hear that the earth was, you know, the created pla place, whatever you want to call it, is formless and void. Right? Correct. So the days of creation are organized to respond to these two problems, right? Formlessness implies there's no order or structure to the creation, right? So then you get the separation of day and night, the separation of the waters above from below to create the heavens and the seas. And then you get the separation of the waters to create the land, okay? And all of these things you could say are, you know, the resources Or life. And then the people who actually use the resources appear and fill in that space, right? So that takes care of the void aspect. So the sun and moon and stars govern the day and the night, right? The birds and the fish fill the heavens and the seas, and the animals and man uh, occupy the land, okay? There's some other fun stuff, though, when you think about how these, how these are all structured together, okay? So these, so to speak, these three here are static. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but they don't change, okay? I mean, day and night, they kind of swap, but it's an ongoing thing. It's static. It's, it's a pattern, constant pattern, okay? The, the sea and the heavens never trade spots. The land and the sea never trade spots, okay? But as you, as you move down, though, you do get something starting here with land. You do get the appearance of, you know, trees and plants and stuff like that, right? So, you know, I plant. Um, not a very good one. Anyway, so you do get some life bubbling up here by the third day. But then it, it, goes, it goes gangbusters here in, in number four. Now you've got a lot more movement happening here until you are, everything is crowned with the creation of man. And man has the ultimate kind of freedom of movement in the land, okay? So there's a, there's a change from static space to those things which move in that space, okay? The sun and the moon and stars, you know, uh, moving through the heavens and changing by their orbit and the fish in the sky, uh, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, all of that kind of thing, okay? So I think that's a really neat uh, 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 part of how this is so poetic and lovely. I'm going to do one thing real quick here. Actually, I'll forget about it. Uh, the next thing is that these next days here, or these, these days that are parallel to one another, also give us what is ruled, and that which rules. So not only do these objects move more in, the, in these static spaces, but they also govern it. They have dominion in these spaces, in these spheres. Okay? So we'll learn about that more. But the sun and moon and stars control the day and the night. Okay? The birds and the fish, they sort of have their own dominions within the heavens and within the seas, okay? Man does not have the same um, movement and power in the heavens and the sea, okay? And then finally, you get man governing all that happens on the land. Although man does have some authority also over the fish 
and over the birds too. But it's but they have a little bit more authority in their spheres, you know, than man does over the heavens and the seas. Okay. And I think I mentioned this before that there is a progression in both of these things to get to the land and the fruitfulness of the land. So the end of the third day is a land that's starting to generate vegetation. And then by the sixth day, you get man who is now living on the face of the earth, cultivating the garden, that kind of thing. Okay. So again, these days are structured with poetic beauty and skill. Okay. I won't say anything more about that. I think I've hit that, I've beat that horse to death by now. All right, so let's actually look at the first two verses. We read through the entire creation account last time. I don't know if we need to do that every time we get together, you know, but you guys, you guys have already hopefully been looking at this anyways, and we, we looked at it last, uh, the last time we met. So verses one through two, I'll read that for us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. All right, so everything begins with God. The creation account is about God. He is the subject. And this God is described, as I mentioned before, with the title Elohim. I'll write that for you. You might be familiar with that. Boy, my handwriting is tremendous. Okay, Elohim, which is the plural form, I believe, of El or Eloi, I think but I'm pretty sure it's just L. Okay. Elohim is plural. Now, Christians will look at that and say, that is probably pointing to the Trinity, that God has some plurality within himself. Okay. However, as far as the way that it's used in Genesis, it would be, it would be very hard to say from from the perspective of Genesis and the perspective of the Old Testament, that it's a direct indication of the Trinity. But the way that we read scripture now is from the perspective of the New Testament, right? And the New Testament shines a light on the old. Or as St. Augustine once said, the new is in the old concealed the old is in the new revealed. He said it in Latin though, not in English, so. But the Old Testament is revealed in the new more, more so, okay? Now there are some other indications that the Trinity is in the background here. But before I move on, I would say that as far as the Israelites understand Elohim, it, the plural form of Elohim indicates that God has these infinite possibilities and potentialities within himself. He is all powerful and anything can happen with God. It is what scholars will also call a plural of majesty, like royalties using the royal we, okay? Now the heart of creation, as I said, is God who creates, who speaks, who gives life. So at the heart of creation isn't an idea. It's not an atom, like the smallest molecule you can find. It's not love, you know, it's not a feeling. Uh, there's not some great unity. It is a person. When you dig, if you dig down to try to discover the root of reality, you will find this person who loves. So personality, in a way, 
is the root and purpose of life. And we as humans reflect God. And as we understand ourselves as persons, understand one another as persons, and God as a person, we are understanding what creation is, what human life is, why we are here, okay? Now we could get into the idea of personhood another time, but it's important to know that what lies at the heart of creation is a person, namely Elohim. And this Elohim, this person here, God, creates. Now I, I wrote the Hebrew last time, the verb for create is bara in Hebrew. And bara is used exclusively of God. No other person in the entire Old Testament is ever said to bara, to create. Only God. Now, what does bara mean? There is some debate about that. Some people think that bara means God is making something out of nothing. Bara always means something brand new is created instantly. The way that it is used in other contexts, though, show that you can also use bara when you have elements already there. So if, let's say, God bara's a chair, he can do that using pre-existing wood. Okay, does that make sense? So it's not like he has to snap his fingers and something pops out of nowhere. Okay. But what it does indicate in every, in every context or predominantly is that something new, something perfect, something fresh has been made. So it does indicate something now exists that didn't before in the sense that I had a pile of wood here and now I have a chair. That chair did not exist before. The materials did exist, but the chair did not. Okay, so God creates from this pre-existing mass that's there, this dark and formless uh, void planet, this fresh, new, perfect creation. Okay, now I'm not saying that God didn't create everything. God did. Okay, but the way that the creation account is given to us is from the perspective of Israel, from the perspective of seeing life as we know it, as we have it now. It's not a philosophical treatise about how matter came about. Okay, does that make sense? That's more of what John 1.1 1, 1 has to say, right? In the beginning, God, uh, in the beginning was the word, etc. This verb is also uh, what we would call telic. You guys are getting into some grammar and some complex stuff here, but I mean, it's kind of a fun, fun thing to think about this, okay? So it, it's what we would call telic, which means that the beginning, middle, and end of the action is in the verb. So another example of a telic verb would be sell. I sell you um, a pet product. That verb indicates the complete transaction, right? It doesn't say, it doesn't, I mean, it includes that I took it off the shelf, that you paid for it, that you took it out of the store and walked home with it, okay? But sell, sell includes all that. So same thing with bara creation. God creates, boom. And as I said before, it's a summary of everything that happens in the ensuing six days. Mm. Okay. It's a it's a summary of that. It's not the first act of creation. Again, verse one is telling you everything that happens in those six days. Okay, so that's that's a very important point. Okay, more poetry for you. I'm just going to throw fun terms at you as well. Can you mention that God made the heavens and the earth? Right. Yes, sir. Correct. Well, when we when we read that. We have to understand that this way of speaking is poetic. 
a lot of what we read in Genesis is poetic. Mm. Heavens and the earth is what we would call in poetry and its use in other, other places in the scripture, a mirrorism. How about that? Linda, mm. you're thrilled yeah, yeah. to hear that. <laughs> Uh, a mirrorism basically is a way of summarizing up everything by naming the two extremes. So I say from the east to the west, which means everything in between. Or I say, and day and night I was working. What is that? What, what am I saying there? Am I excluding afternoon or something like that? No, I'm saying all time. Okay, so it's not that God exclusively made the heavens and exclusively made the earth and everything else wasn't made. It's saying all of it was made, including the universe. Okay, everything is included with the idea of heavens and earth. And with that, that implies from the broader context of scripture that what God made was orderly. Okay. Heavens and the earth, heavens and earth is contrasted then conceptually with void and formless. So everything is chaotic here at the beginning. But the heaven when God makes the heavens and the earth he is making something that's now orderly. Okay, so they're kind of antagonistic to one another in that sense, that he is making something orderly. Okay. As I, I feel like I've talked about this quite a bit, but I, I do need to bring it up again for us here. When the Lord comes upon the creation, when, when, we, when we're given a window into what's happening in the beginning, we find a formless, void, uh, kind of shadowy deep with darkness over the face of it. And as I said before, Genesis does not tell us where this watery chaos originated. It's just there. Same thing with Satan or the serpent. We don't know where he came from. We don't know exactly how he became so evil and antagonistic to God's creation. Which is, this is an important point to mention. A lot of debates about Genesis uh, and, and our interest about Genesis is surrounded by the debate about evolution and behavior and that kind of thing, right? Uh, Ken or Carla? That's not me. Uh, would you guys, you can mute, you can mute your mic and, and you can then uh, unmute it when you have a question. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'd appreciate, I'd appreciate that because that's very distracting. And if you don't, I will mute you <laughs> for, for you. Okay. And you will lose stuff. No, but I want you to be able to participate, but that's, that's very distracting and it's not your fault. This is technology. Okay. So. A lot of our debates about Genesis, our conversations about Genesis are over evolution and the age of the earth, that kind of thing, okay? I'm gonna put my cards on the table and tell you that I do, I do not believe that evolution can explain the origin of the creation. And I do not believe that the earth is uh, extraordinarily old either, okay? I, I, I just don't see how science could really give us the, I don't see how science has the power to provide that explanation. But what I will say though, is that we cannot just rope Genesis up into our battles. We have to accept Genesis as it is. Genesis is not a science textbook. It's not trying to give us a comprehensive explanation for how everything came about, right? Um, what it wants to tell us is here is the God who elected Israel so that he could bring about the blessing again to all nations. Here's the God who encountered a fallen world and, and uh, undid the curse. 
Make sense? So it's not a science textbook. So this watery, chaotic, formless void is already there, which tells you that you cannot date the earth using Genesis because Genesis doesn't tell you where that watery, formless planet came from. It's already there. Does that make sense? So I'm not saying that you can use that to prove evolution or prove that the earth is billions of years old. But what I am saying is that we have to respect the language of Genesis and exactly what it's giving, giving to us, okay? Um, so hear, hear, me, hear me with a grain of, uh, not a grain of salt, but understand there's a qualification to what I'm saying here. Um, so we do not know where that comes from, how it got into such a bad state, so to speak, okay? Now, I'll go ahead. Mostly, right. Well, what it, what it, it does not specifically say, right, that God created that formless and empty void. Now, we understand theologically that he had to. And you could go to other places in the scriptures that talk about God made everything that exists. You know what I mean? Right, with, that refers to the orderly existence that is the six days, okay? okay? But the Hebrew grammar does not allow that second verse to be a part of the first one, right? It's, it's an exclusive statement. It's more like the title. Really, verse one should be just set apart by itself, okay? In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, just so you know. Now, as he, now, when that process begins, there's this dark, formless, empty void there. You see what I'm saying there? But I'm not saying that he didn't make that as if that always existed with God. Because we hear again in John 1, 1, right? Everything that was made was made through the word. All right. Point blank. Yes. You know, right. this goes into the book. Uh, have you considered about the plants, the animals, the birds, the bees, the you know? The bird just decide to fly all of a sudden out of the out of the clear blue and develop a brain? No, God right. created that. Yes. Just and as much as the birds and the turtles, sure. the worms and everything else. And that uh so Ken uh, or uh, Frank mentions here that that life is so rich and complex that it would be very hard to say that it just originated out of a single cell organism that somehow through a process of evolution developed. I mean, I'm not going to get into all that. I do think it's a little absurd as a grand explanation for how everything came about. Right. Uh, Correct. You know, irreducible complexity. There are all sorts of philosophical holes in the argument for evolution. Okay. That's not really where I want to spend a whole lot of my time, but we can talk about some of that. Now, uh, to, to your, in addition to your comment though, Frank, I would mention that when God makes the birds and the fish, he makes them as what's called in Hebrew, nefesh. They are living beings, okay? And in that way, they have these desires for food and procreation and uh, instinct. They move, they, they are reaching out to goals. They are accomplishing uh, life and the needs of life okay so god makes these living nefesh these living creatures um with their with their own beauty and life and goals and plans and all of that stuff right and it's just amazing to see that um and i believe that comes up in job where god god says to job you know i'm paraphrasing this but he says think for a moment about the the goats who are hopping amongst the mountain rocks are you in any way involved when one of those goats way up in the mountains give birth no you don't have any control over that creation is so much bigger than you are and i'm in control of it this is my orderly world all right and so yes somewhere off in the distance up in the andes there is like an eagle who is laying a nest uh, and giving birth to her chicks. 
and we have no idea that's going on. Nobody knows. You know, I just think that's an incredible uh, thought, okay? But God has made these things as nefesh. So back to void and empty, because that's how I'm feeling right now these days. Void and empty, because we are still suffering with this craziness about the coronavirus. <laughs> um, void and empty are, uh, I'm using these things to equate one another, okay? There's also formless or chaotic, but void and empty, they kind of relate, they relate to one another here. Um, and every time these, every time void, I'll just, I'll do it this way. Every time void shows up, it's always joined with, with formless or waste, okay? So formless always comes up with it in the Bible. Now, it really only comes up two other places in the Bible, all right? So it's not an incredibly popular term. But it's important to know those verses because it's going to give you a taste of the the tone of these words, okay? They're not positive words, by the way. So for instance, Jeremiah 4.23 has this. I looked on the earth and behold, it was without form and void and to the heavens and they had no light. That's in Jeremiah 4.23. The context of what Jeremiah is saying is that he is predicting a future judgment of God against Israel. So formless and void already have this connotation of judgment and curse, right? <laughs> it's a punishment. It's an undoing of life-giving order and goodness. Make sense? Right? So these are not neutral terms in that way. Also in Isaiah 34, 11, Isaiah will point to the consequences of Israel's breaking of the covenant and God's punishment. And what will happen to the land of Israel is this. The hawk and the porcupine shall possess it. The owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of confusion over it. That's the same word for formless, what is in the Hebrew called tohu not tofu, if that's what you were thinking. And the plumb line of emptiness, he shall stretch over it. And emptiness is obviously what? The bohu, void, okay? So again, void and formless have the idea of judgment baked into those, those words, okay? Why is it so bad? Why is it so bad then that... Um, that the world is initially formless and empty. What are we to see there? The creation account itself is moving toward life-giving blessing and order. That's the goal of the creation. So formless and empty points to an inhospitable sphere. Life cannot exist in the formlessness and the emptiness. In a way, we start out the creation account with an anti-creation, okay? Something that is, is harsh, hostile, and opposed to life. But God, through his word, is going to redeem that formless and empty mass so that life can be there. So God is pro-life in that sense. God desires life uh, to flourish, and I'll talk a little bit about pro-life stuff on, on, on Sunday. But you can see the goodness of life. That goodness uh, of life is God's goal. And this uh, comes up in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. For the Lord, for thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it, he did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. So Isaiah summarizes the creation as 
a life-giving, hospitable place. God did not make the heavens and the earth to be unoccupied or uninhabited. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the thrust of what the creation account is all about. Mm -hmm. Now, here's some more fun stuff. So, over this, uh, or this, the earth is without form and void and darkness okay, over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is hovering over, over the waters there too, yes. Now, in the Bible, darkness is never a good thing. Correct. Right? Again, we've got more negative terms here. Darkness always represents evil and death. Okay? So we've got, a, we've got, again, something that is totally opposed to life, the opposite of goodness and life. For example, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 15, darkness is a plague on Egypt. And again, God governs the darkness. He uses it for his purposes. So I'm not saying that, that darkness is outside of his control, just as the formless and empty void is not outside of his control. Okay. Darkness is also promised to befall the wicked. As a punishment, in First uh, Samuel chapter uh, two, verse nine, I'll just read that real quick. Yes, this is this comes from the Song of Hannah, after she is blessed with the birth of Samuel, after she had been barren and praying for a child. And she sings a song that sounds very much like Mary's song, the Magnificat. Both of these things are related to one another. And she, and she sings out, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness for not by might shall man prevail. Also in Job, which is a very important book for the understanding of Genesis as well. It's probably the one book that we have that's most contemporaneous with Genesis or comes about about the same time, okay? In a Job 3, verses 4 through 5, Job compares darkness to the place of death. So it's not only punishment, but it's the realm of death. Uh, Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. And he goes on to talk about darkness, 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 gloom and doom. Let the stars of its dawn be dark, uh, etc. He goes on to say, so darkness represents, he wants darkness to consume the day of his birth so that he would die or have died. That's his desire again, okay? And then maybe the most uh, important point for our purposes as we're looking to the future return of our savior is that the day of the Lord's return will be a day of thick clouds and gloom and darkness because it will also be a day of judgment for those who have not received the Savior. And that is uh, uh, given to us in one instance in, G uh, in Isaiah chapter 13, where the Lord says through the prophet, verse 10, for the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So he's talking about the, the end of the world through um, kind of a picture of the judgment of Babylon in that section. And note what happens at the hour of, of, of our Lord's death. It gets dark. Right? Yeah. All connected, right? At, at our Lord's death, that darkness and death and judgment is coming down upon. And what we will do on Good Friday is turn off all the lights, you know, in the sanctuary. It's going to give a, an indication of that 
darkness of judgment upon the Savior. Okay? Yes, you're, pre- you're, you're getting ahead of me. But that's good. That's good, right? That's where we're heading. Yes, thank you. Frank, you keep him in line. Um, no, yeah, that's where we're heading because darkness represents evil. It's not good. Okay, it doesn't do anything for anybody. Darkness will ultimately then have to be dispelled uh, as evil. And he'll begin to dispel it on the first day when he separates the darkness from the light and names them day and night, okay? And then he'll ultimately dispel it, read as you said, right, in Revelation chapter 21, right, which is a picture of um, the day when our Lord returns for us, okay? Not the picture of the creation after the thousand year millennium reign, Carla, as we, as we talked about uh, before. In verses 22 to 25, this is, this is uh, the description. And I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of the Lord gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. By its light will the nations walk, etc. The kings of the earth bring their glory into it. Verse 25 is the most important. And there will be no night there. Okay. There's a good good Charles Wesley hymn. Uh, It's called Away with All Sorrow and Fear. And the final, uh, or I think it's the third stanza. No, the fourth stanza of it. Has this great meditation on uh, the light of the new creation there. Um, uh, anyways, no, he says, no need of the sun in that day, which never is followed by night, when Jesus's beauties display a pure and a permanent light, the lamb mm-hmm. is their light and their sun, and lo, by reflection they shine, with Jesus ineffably one, and bright in effulgence divine. Wow. Uh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good hymn. Any hymn, you, any hymn that has effulgence in it, you know, is... It's a great hymn, I think. Okay. That also goes right along with uh, when uh, God said it's going to be good to create a new heaven for us. Yes. And the, the darkness of the hell where Satan is loving. And yes. The people that don't believe in that, that's where they will reside, and there's no escaping out of there. Yeah, that's right, Frank. It's a good way uh, to describe hell as a place of darkness. That would be great. And that's sort of how Jesus describes it too, right? In that place, cast him into the outer darkness, right? Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, you know, darkness is uh, judgment, evil, chaos. All those things are related, okay? Now, this is a really neat idea, though. So this darkness, while I've talked about it in terms of judgment, punishment, kind of disaster, it's not quite the same thing as moral evil, okay? The darkness is not Satan, okay? The darkness doesn't have a will or desire, okay? It's what you might call irrational evil. I just think this is the neatest idea. I, I, mean, I, I feel like I should need to just write something on this or study this more. Um, or what, what one of the commentators I read called surd evil, like absurd, okay? Surd evil. It's like hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, uh, things that destroy that don't have a moral volition or will, okay? This already exists in the beginning. There's already something there antagonistic to life. I just think that that's, that's an amazing, amazing thing, okay? Now, we don't know, we don't know, again, the origin of this irrational evil, 
Uh, this comes up in John chapter nine, the healing of a man born blind. I'm gonna talk about this on Sunday in a different context. But in that, in that encounter with the man born blind, it begins with the disciples asking Jesus a question. Do any of you remember that question? Yes. Yeah. What sin did this man commit or what sin did his parents commit that he was born blind? And Jesus says, nah, nah, dog. <laughs> That's my terrible slang, slang term for it. Um, no way. He was born blind so that the works of God might be manifested in him. Right. So not all evil in the world is a direct result of sin. Okay. Now, broadly speaking, this uh, we would say that there is chaos and disaster that enters into the world because of the fall of man. It has what you might call ecological ramifications. We, we get a lot of that conversation around the environmentalist movement, okay? Man is wrecking the world, making it, making it inhospitable to animals and itself. Um, and there's some truth to that. But the Lord says that there's also this kind of evil that pre-exists the fall. Okay? There's already this disorder. And it's bounded. It's held in. Just like the sea is bounded by the land and the darkness will be bounded by the light when they are divided from one another. But we shouldn't just jump like... What was some of the 700 club when there was a there was like a hurricane that struck the struck Haiti and the gentleman on the 700 club I forget what his name is now he said well it was because the Haitians made a compact with the devil and that was why they were struck by this hurricane or could you know when Katrina happened I think there was some things that you know well you know their God is just washing the scum of New Orleans off the earth because they're a bunch of heathens and hedonists, you know, and, and in a sense, yeah, but what's Jesus' response to that kind of thing? You need to repent. Otherwise, something worse will happen to you, right? When the Tower of Siloam fell on those, on the Galileans or whatever, um, and G Jesus says, you need to repent. You need to think about your own sins. But I'm not going to say that the Bible ever really says that there's a one for one thing. Well, it's because of Mardi Gras that God sent the, that the levee broke and the and uh, Hurricane Katrina was able to flood New Orleans. I don't think it's it's wise wise to say that. And part of that goes back to Job's account. Okay, the whole story of Job. Okay, hold on. Uh, you had your hand up first. Yeah, right? your reference of evil even comes right into the time of the flood. Yeah, because uh, that's what God had to be able to, and then He wanted to protect Noah and his family because they were the only truth, truthful, yeah. really Christian. Now, the the flood though would be an example of God sending irrational evil as a direct punishment for sin. Okay, so it's not quite the same thing as I'm as I'm talking about here, but it's related. No. It's related yeah. because it is a direct punishment. Um, but he does use irrational evil. He does use that flood to, you know, punish them and destroy life. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is that not every disaster is a one for one result of somebody's sin. Does that make sense? Why did my child die? Well, I'm not going to say that it's, be no one should say that, well, it's because you made this mistake here. Or you're a sinner or something along those lines. Right. But what is, what's the lesson that Job has to learn? He was, he was righteous. He was justified in the sight of God, but he still had to keep his mouth shut when it came to this question about irrational evil and suddenly just trust that the Lord was in control and would use irrational evil for his purposes, okay? So this also happens in the Genesis account where God uses a famine in the land of, of Canaan and Egypt to draw uh jacob and his family into the orbit of joseph so that they could settle in the land of goshen and and wait out that time to eventually come out in the exodus does that make sense so god used that evil irrational evil of the famine for his greater purposes just as he uses the moral evil of joseph's brothers right to bring about the salvation of many too okay right. what we 
we do know that death entered the world through sin. Yes. And, and all, all current death is not a murder or whatever. It's not a result of specific sin. Yes. But it's the result of a sin. Like yes. The condition of sin, correct? Yes. Um, I would say the result is the unleashing of that because it is good. It's better to think about it like a dam that breaks because it is bound. The sea is bound and the, the waters above the heavens and below are bound and the darkness is bound by the light. But when we sin, we distort the created order. And, the, and everything breaks down, the dam breaks. And so what happens? The flood waters come, right? Or the darkness begins to gain power, enters into the garden, that kind of thing. Or, um, you know, take your case in point or whatever. But it, our sin, the fall did affect the world. But it's, it should be understood as not, it's not the origin of evil, but it twists things so that chaos is able to enter into the, into it and have its way with the creation. Okay, that's kind of a subtle, maybe it's too subtle of an interpretation. Go ahead, Rick. I don't think it's subtle. I just find that we're talking about evil existing, the reaction of evil existing before the fall. Yeah. My understanding of what God created and intended. In a sense, now God has control and authority over it. He bought, he bound, he bounds evil. And we will see in the new heavens and the new earth that there is no darkness and there is no sea, no sea either in, in the new creation, so to speak, which I don't know if you want to take that literally or not, because the sea is understood to be symbolic of chaos. Okay. It has to be bound. So I think there, I mean, I don't know if I would uh, state it as the fact that there will not be an ocean in the new creation. Um, who knows? Who knows? Okay. I'm not going to go into all of that because a lot of revelation is symbolic. Um, but it, what we should understand is surge evil or irrational evil will no longer take place in the new creation. There will never be an accident. Okay. There will never be a five car pileup. There will never be an earthquake that, that takes down a city. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that progression only happens because Christ comes and now has dominion and authority over all things, over the principalities and powers of, of, of because he suffered death. Uh, he suffered that chaos. It was all brought, brought on to himself and he absorbed it and then overcame it in his resurrection. So we were, I think, supposed to do that in the beginning. I think we were supposed to dominate evil and we actually let evil control us and have its way with us as, a, as the human race, right? We were supposed to beat what Adam should have done as soon as he saw that snake was beat it to death and get it out of the garden. You know what I mean? Get it back behind those walls. Uh, keep keep uh, evil from encroaching but he submitted to Satan and then everything got twisted and turned upside down. Okay. So, and then, you know, as, as mankind would move, I think that there would be some way that man would dispel that darkness or God would use man to dispel that darkness. And that ultimately happens in Jesus who is the light of the world. And as John says, the light has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. Right. And it was life and the life was the light of men and all that stuff. Okay. And that weird. I just, again, we talked about how foundational Genesis is for the rest of the Bible. Like just these concepts of darkness and light that are so prominent in revelation or in John's gospel, you got to have Genesis in the background to sort of understand these things and they mutually inform one another. Okay. 
So again, God's going to use these things for his purpose. And, and uh, the darkness is over the deep, okay? Which I will just say, you know, the deep is understood also to be a place of death. It's the pit. Um, it's sort of this prime evil ocean of chaos, okay? So everything gets started with very ominous and uncomfortable words. And I already pointed out that this all might echo the fall, the fall of the angels in the background, okay? I'm not going to say that that's necessarily the case, but it could have been that the war in heaven, you know, Satan's opposition, all that stuff uh, came about. And that as a result of that, the creation was plunged into chaos and turmoil until God redeemed it, reformed it, and then positioned his vice regent, his king in the creation. And that is Adam and Eve in the image of God who were to have dominion over, over the created world until they also submitted to Satan as well. So you see how that works? Now though, the spirit is present over this dark, formless and empty abyss. All right? And that's, uh, let, me, let me get to that real quick here. This is the easiest study to flip back to because it's right at the beginning of the book. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So that's the first sign of gospel. Now that's the first sign that something's going to change for the better here. Okay. As far as the narrative goes, the, the spirit is not hovering over the deep, but hovering over the face of the waters. Waters has more of a positive connotation to it than deep does. Deep is this uh, imposing, threatening gulf that will swallow you up. But the waters give a little bit more of a hint of, of life giving power, okay? So we, we're already getting a little glimpse into what's gonna be happening later. The spirit is hovering. I referred to this before when we were talking about the Trinity. Uh, the verb means to flutter or fly and is used in the context of an eagle fluttering over its young in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. So it does not point to a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. That's how some secular uh, translations will do it, or some, some who are antagonistic to Christianity will translate it, I think. They'll say a mighty wind or the wind of God was over the waters. Um, but uh, no, it's the spirit, the ruach of God hovering or fluttering like a bird as, as the actual Hebrew there okay now you could translate ruach as wind but wind is never described elsewhere in the bible as fluttering it's always an it's it's a person or a living being that's doing this thing okay and i would say given what we know from the new testament this is the holy spirit of god god's own personal spirit the spirit is always involved in creative activity in the bible too he is the Lord and giver of life, as we confess in the Nicene Creed. And what he does uh, in, in similar circumstances is fill, for instance, uh, Bezalel, and that, that name will be on the test. <laughs> so remember him, Bezalel. Um, he was filled with the spirit of God to have the creative power to build the tabernacle and its furnishings and put together its wood beams and carve everything, okay? And, and do the, and put together the, um, the stitching of the, of the ephod and the linen uh, um, robe and all that stuff for the priests, okay? It was the spirit behind the scenes though, giving him those talents and abilities to build a sort of tabernacle, which in a way is a picture of the created world, okay? The tabernacle itself is a little microcosm, a small cosmos. It is the created world in itself, okay? So I think, isn't that neat, right? The spirit's there also helping him create the tabernacle where God will dwell. Uh, and, and then some people would also say that the tabernacle is sort of a picture of the Garden of Eden. It's this special set apart walled place for people to dwell with God. Okay? And then it will move out into the rest of the world when our Lord returns, so to speak. You talk about so much about the water and everything else. The water is the source of all life, no matter how you look at it, mm -hmm. whether it's us 
the animals, the birds, the bees, and wherever else. All these animals are made up of like 80 to 90 percent water. Yeah. And so life comes from that water, and that's what they talked about so much. Yeah. Maybe through baptism. Yeah, yeah. Water can become a life giving force, even as it can become a destructive force. And we'll talk, you know, in baptismal imagery, two things are happening. What are the two things happening in baptism, so to speak? The Baptists uh, get it a little bit better and because they dunk people. Um, drowning, right? That's the first thing. And then resurrection, okay? Kind of birthed out of those waters, like uh, the, the, the font, the baptismal font is a womb. Uh, and it's uh, it's sort of even shaped like that, I believe, at times. Um, that is uh, the the dual power of water at work. Okay, but it must be under the control and will of God. Water can just as easily snuff out life as it can give life, right? So that's a good uh, that's a good point. Okay, and then where else does the Holy Spirit come? around in a very important creative act. I was just jam jamming out there for a second. And the and the power of the most high, what was he gonna say? Pentecost, Pentecost yeah, would be a good example. The, the spirit does come as a mighty wind and, uh, and form the church. But I'm thinking a little bit preceding that, Jesus birth. Yes, the, and the spirit, right, overshadows Mary. Can I, I just can imagine the spirit hovering over the face of the waters, the spirit hovering over Mary. You know what I mean? And then out of her womb comes the Savior, right? right. So I just think that there's a, that's a neat, neat connection. The spirit is always there bringing about life out of that chaos, bringing order, bringing creative power uh, into the world. Okay. Any thoughts or questions about that? You guys, are you guys following this? Am I getting too, am I getting too much in the weeds here? Is this all good stuff? Yes. It's good stuff. You guys are liking it. Okay. So, and then let's, well, now we're going to be in, in verses three through 21, etc. So, and God said, verse three, let there be light. And there was light. God speaks the world into existence. Uh, his word is what makes the uh, brings about this order. And right from the get-go, then, there is a clear distinction between the creator and the creation. Okay? The creation does not flow out of God. It is not one with God. It is not a part of God, like pantheism. Okay? There's this idea, uh, and it's also related to, I think, Platonic philosophy or uh, kind of uh, some other philosophical schools where there is this oneness, there's this prim primordial unity and everything then flows out of that oneness. And our job is to return back to the one, the great one. Uh, and that's also in Buddhism, you know, to, to be consumed in uh, nothingness, so to speak. Uh, or Hinduism to, to return to Brahma, everyone is Brahma, you know, this idea. No, fundamental to the Western way of viewing the world and the Christian way, which informed the Western uh, way of viewing the world, is the distinction between the creator and the creation, so that there is an order, a personal order that can be communicated rationally through the word, logos, right, to the mind, to understand it, okay? very central to how we have science or anything like that, okay? Um, but there is a clear distinction between the creator and the, what is the product of his will and word, the creation. Uh, however, though this creation is in, it is separate or distinct, it is totally dependent upon God for its life. It cannot exist on its own. And Paul will reiterate that as he preaches to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17. Um, I think that's where he's at. I think he's at the Areopagus. Uh, he himself, referring to God, gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And in him we live and move and have our being. 
So we are distinct from God, but utterly dependent upon God. And that's fundamental, okay? Uh, and, and that's why marriage becomes this picture of that entity, right? That you have these two distinct persons coming together, uh, dependent upon one another, one flesh with one another, but still distinct in this kind of divine dance, which is a reflection of the Trinity too, okay? All right, then God creates this light, let there be light and divides it from the darkness, right? And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day, verses three through five. This light though, what is this light that he makes? What the heck is that? Now, remember, we don't get the sun until what day? Or stars. Fourth day. Yeah. So where, where is this light coming from? Did you guys ever think about this? He makes light before he made the sun? Huh? Already you can see how this is not scientific writing. Okay? We have no way to conceive of this right? We can only think of energy sources that produce light by means of catalytic uh, chemical reactions or whatever, right? We don't understand pure light coming into existence. We can't understand this scientifically, all right? Um, this is not, I don't think it's to be understood as a natural light, though. Again, I've already mentioned Darkness as symbolic for evil and judgment, and even irrational evil. Light would then be symbolic for irrational good, I guess, right? Yeah, goodness, blessing, what brings about life. And it's the first thing that God calls good, because it can bring about life. There is nothing good about the dark, formless, empty void, right? I think so. I think it's to be symbolic of his control over the authority. What's that? Before the rest of what he created, which is magic. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, like, yeah, I think it is to be symbolic of a greater spiritual reality that God is in control of evil. It binds evil and dispels evil. Okay. Um, so we shouldn't see it as Nat, like the creation of natural light, that all of a sudden there's this light coming out of nowhere, okay? Perhaps. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm willing, I'm always willing to change my mind on these things and, and to learn more. So don't take it as the final word, but that's, that's my sense for my study, okay? Which means, polemically speaking, by polemically, I mean, Genesis is also written in a context where there are false creation accounts, and false gods and false theories about the origins of the world, okay? Where the sun is treated like a god, right? Or the moon, etc. Well, God is saying, actually, I make light, not only sun. So I am the origin even of the sun's light. So the sun cannot be a god, nor can light itself be a god. I am light and sun, the origin of both light and sun, okay? Uh, so I think that there's something to that as well. Light represents throughout the Bible, the realm of goodness in which the righteous dwell. So it comes up all over the place in the Psalms, Psalm 27, verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Um, or think about the transfiguration account, which we'll be looking at on Sunday, right? There's this divine glory that flows out of Christ. His face shines, his body shines. That is the uncreate, or that's the light, I think, of the, of the beginning, perhaps, right? Or there's this light that belongs to who God is. And he's able to share that with his creation. Okay. Also, Psalm 97, 11, light is sown for the righteous, and joy for the upright in heart. So light will be a reward for the righteous, for those who trust in the Lord. 
uh, and, and find salvation in him. Okay. So God and his righteous ones dwell in light. The evil one dwells in darkness. And the theme of light will also play out in the life of Israel. While Egypt was plunged into darkness as that second to last curse, right? Israel enjoys light in the land of Goshen. So the light shines on the righteous Israelites while Egypt is plunged into darkness. Also, the Lord will graciously lead Israel out of Egypt by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. So he will be their light and lead their way, right? And then finally, um, the Israelites would then, as a symbol and sign of this perpetual light, put a battery-operated candle in the tabernacle and hang it from the roof. I don't, that's not right, is it? <laughs> I don't think that's right, no. They light a lamp. It's the lamp stand, okay? So they, they always keep a lamp or a light lit before the Lord in the tabernacle, which I think is to indicate to point back to this ultimate source of light being God and, and his light being the place in which the <laughs> righteous dwell and all that stuff, okay? And like uh, Hanukkah is sort of an example of that, that too, later Jewish festival. Okay, so then after God creates its light, he declares that it is good. Good always connotes what is useful, fitting, healthy, that which will bring about life. So light is the first sign that there will be life in this new creation, besides the spirit of God being, being present there, okay? So then this proclamation of goodness upon the light invites us, as we read this, to trust in God for all that is good, that God's purposes, despite the darkness, are ultimately benevolent, right? He wishes to bring us light and blessing, that kind of thing. So what lies behind the existence of the world is a person who is bestowing goodness and blessing, who is giving light, not a fearful mystery or an uncaring cosmic force, right, or, or nothingness. It's a person giving light and life uh, to us. And then he will divide this darkness and light from one another. And uh, the point about division is very important. I'm just going to rush through this with the last couple minutes here, okay? Darkness remains but it becomes separated, bounded, and distinct, okay? This will then begin an important process of division within Israel, uh, okay? Israel's experience and then the rest of the Bible, okay? We don't like division. We live, uh, if you listen to the Biden inauguration and, and the, the poem and all that stuff, right? Uh, we want unity, et cetera. And that's, I mean, politically speaking, I, under, I understand what he's going for. Democracy is also a space in which there are to be civil disagreements. So that's probably the, the heart of democracy's power is not unity per se, but it is to be able to civilly disagree, which is a stern rebuke to both sides of the aisle and how certain things have gone down in these past a couple of months, okay? Uh, actually, this whole past year. Um, but division is important and belongs to the people of God and their activity as, a, as it belongs to God's activity. So you got to distinguish good and evil. You got to distinguish light from darkness, okay? You separate these things out. The division will begin most prevalently with Genesis 3.15. What division is set in place there? The Proto-Evangelion is how that's talked about. The first gospel promise that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So the Lord would put animosity between believers and unbelievers, and they would forever clash, but there would be a distinction between them. I have separated you out from Satan and his offspring. Makes sense, right? So there's already a division there. We'll see that division theme come up again with the call of Abraham to leave his home, his country, his father's land, and all his father's false gods and go into the land of Canaan, separated out, divided out, and sent to a new, new land, okay? And then in Israel's experience, there's going to be all sorts of division. 
If you read through your favorite book, Leviticus, you'll see tons of distinguishing between clean and unclean, between different types of animals, yes, between what is sacred and profane, okay? So that becomes a mark of Israel's unique identity being belonging to the Lord, okay? They've been called out from the world to belong to God, and therefore they make distinctions in their life between all of these different things, clean and unclean, unholy, and, uh, and holy. And uh, they will even be divided from the rest of the nations by the sign of circumcision, so to speak, right? Which involves a division of something in particular, but we won't get into all of that. All right. So this gen Genesis then uh, foreshadows the boundaries of the law, okay? God loves boundaries, this far and no further, okay? But we always toe the line. We transgress the line even, right? We push the limit, okay? And that's the problem. But uh, so this division will also come up in the issues of the orders of creation, right? The role between children and parents, uh, the role between male and female, uh, the, you know, all sorts of different orders, even the distinctions between animal life and human life, okay? And everybody uh, belonging in their particular spheres, okay? So uh, when everything sticks to its allotted place and role, there is order. But when they don't, then there is chaos. And Lutherans love order, right? All is in order, you know. Uh, we are, we are, you know, are hist historically speaking, we are good Germans, and uh, we we like our uh, our states and vocations. Everybody uh, sticking to their lane and playing their role uh, in this orderly, beautiful German land. Okay. So, but that's also how the, that's how the Lord works too. All right, that's it. I'm sorry. I feel, I, I just pummeled you guys with information here. We got through, we got through, I, I'll say that we got through two verses. Now we're working on the next three, okay? Three, four, and five. Um, but are you guys liking that? Is this, is this good? Is this enough information that's keeping you interested and, and, uh, you won't hear this anywhere else, unless you, uh, unless you, unless you um, read. A, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. But I, I want it to be practical. I want you to be be able to see more about what's going on in the Bible because of this. Seeing these these primal elements at play, light and darkness, and evil, and all that stuff, um, and that ultimately we are drawn into trusting that our Lord is in control of His world and will bring about. Uh, the completion of his new creation, just as he did on the seventh day, uh, he'll, he'll do it again.